7. We're going to read the first five verses. Matthew 7. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, ye will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I'm going somewhere with this. It's not <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we'll just stop now and open in prayer. Father, we are grateful for the time we can have together in your word. We are especially grateful for your grace to us. That we can anticipate your working in each of our lives as we submit ourselves to the authority of your word and to the ministry of the Spirit that you have promised will guide in each of our hearts individually, guide us into the truth. And so we um, have great confidence this morning as we open your word. We just pray that you would enable us, help us to put aside anything that would distract during this important time, that we might get the full benefit that you desire for us to glean this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can turn to Galatians 6 now. And yeah, you might be wondering, well, what in the world Matthew 7 has to do with where we're at? Well, I was struck in reading one of um, Jesse Abel's recent daily devotionals that I had missed in this an obvious connection with Galatians 6 1, so I'm kind of backfilling. Uh, this, this passage should have come to mind as an obvious parallel. It is one thing, so when you look at 6.1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. It's one thing to recognize a trespass. That comes all too naturally. (laughs) But it's another thing to be in a right condition to come alongside someone in restoration. And in that, one must be spiritual. Uh, And so that's kind of uh, where Matthew 7 is a very close parallel to looking to yourself, making sure that you are in a right position, condition, to be able to come alongside and dealing with someone who needs restoration without making it about, you know, uh, criticism and judgment, things like that. So that's that's a good parallel passage. So I I decided we're not too far down the road to... Go backwards there. Anyway, as we tackle the last part of the section of Galatians from chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, call to Christian service, aside from a bit more development of the absolute nature of sowing and reaping, uh, as Paul expressed it here, we have completed down through verse 8. And so let's go ahead and read the context of this section, starting in verse 7. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, we have observed that in many tangible ways, man does not reap as he sows. In fact, it seems that if man is diligent about anything, it's finding ways, on one hand, to avoid reaping as he has sown on the negative side, and to reap where he has not sown on the positive side. Uh, But we find Paul stating here unequivocally to the point of a stern warning and a reality check concerning the prevailing of God's design, that there is an absolute way in which 
man reaps what he sows. So how may we reconcile the appearances of this law of sowing and reaping and the reality of uh, the absolute of this statement here? Though there are certainly physical ways in which one may and even typically will reap what he sows, there are spiritual ways which are inescapable. We find this in both the present with respect to man's spiritual constitution and the future with respect to ultimate judgment. Whereas there may be ways in which man does not reap physically as he sows in time, in each of these categories he will reap exactly as he sows. Now looking to present spiritual reality first, let's consider the real, this reality with respect to man's spiritual constitution or his makeup. Man is a moral creature. He is made such that his soul is engaged in and affected by his volitional choices. When man indulges his heart in a particular lust, his soul absorbs the negative effects of that action or activity. And on the other side, which applies only to the believer, when a man in the spirit engages his heart in a particular expression of the new man, i.e. application of truth to life, to his life, his soul absorbs the positive effects of that action or activity. Now, I'm not prepared to go into a lengthy treatment of the ways in which the unbeliever may derive positive soul benefits from engaging in what some might categorize as good choices. Uh, we have already affirmed by observation that even unbelievers may benefit, at least in many outward ways in life, from aligning themselves with divine institutions. For instance, uh, when I say divine institutions, you know, talking about marriage and family, you know, the unbeliever will, de will derive benefits from aligning with those institutions. But these benefits do not accrue to eternal salvation or affect eternity in any way, as it were. And they do not prevent the negative soulish consequences that do mount in the heart that goes on rejecting Christ. And unavoidably then, in that state, indulging the flesh in many and even respectable ways. The unbeliever may benefit circumstantially and physically from positive moral choices, obviously, while having a soul that is becoming increasingly hardened to spiritual things. Turn to uh, Matthew 15. Now what I'm going to read at this point does not directly make this point, but from it we may clearly infer that there is a spiritual level of man's function that constitutes a reality that transcends the physical. We're going to read starting in verse 1 and we're going to go down a little ways through 14. does not look right. Well, I'll start it. Maybe it's there. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress yeah, this is right, the tra tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you may, might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far, far from me. And in vain they worship me, worship me, teaching, doctrines, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Okay, this is not what I was looking for. Um, what I was looking for, and it, I'm going to check Mark real quick here, uh, just in case. But it was... Uh, the passage where Christ is speaking uh, about, and it was the eating of, in his eating bread here, but the idea was that um, 
the uh, what goes into the body is not that which uh, condemns one, but it's what what is it? Eighteen. Oh, Matt. Oh, so I didn't read far enough. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how I did that. Well, let's continue reading then. Um, when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand, not oh yeah, it was right, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard you saying this? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. So now, continuing on with what Peter is asking to explain here, Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So man, I guess the point here is man in his flesh is fixated on those things which are physical and tangible. Even, even as we see with the Pharisees here, in this context, as measures of righteousness. But there is a spiritual reality that is of the real essence of man's existence and that transcends what man tends toward. And Christ is, in a, in a sense, revealing that. That's not the primary point of what he's saying necessarily here. But the idea is there's a deeper reality that is at stake. And should that be a foreign thought to us? It is the spiritual reality that governs. It is, the ulti it is ultimately the true reality, for it is the reality occupied by God. And it is the reality that we are called to occupy as believers according to our position in Christ. A passage that would come to mind would be Colossians 3. If you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking those things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are of the earth. So that's the reality that we are to occupy. Not just occupy with, actually occupy it is the reality that Paul has challenged us to in the context of Galatians leading up to where we are in our text now, particularly in looking back the last part of Galatians 5. Now, how about scripture that more directly relates to absolute unavoidable reaping in the spiritual sense? Last time I used sexual promiscuity as a broad area where man has endeavored to and found ways to mitigate reaping what he has sown. And we're going to look at the spiritual side of this now, not because I typically would choose this among other options, but because so much in Scripture is said about the spiritual side of sexual activity. And so it's a good place to go to find explicit Scripture related to this point. From the world's perspective, the only negative consequences from sex are tangible, or at least measurable in some way primarily the physical aspects. And man has been able to avoid many of them and continues to diligently advance ways of avoiding negative consequences for sexual activity. So, in this area for sure, especially, it's probably easy for most to see, we cannot say that man absolutely reaps what he sows physically with respect to illicit sexual activity. But what do we find on the spiritual side of this activity. Turn back first to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs 6, we're going to go to a couple passages in Proverbs. Uh, but we're going to start at verse 23. A 
For the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress, do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. Jump down to verse 32. Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. We find here commingled with, with judicial temporal consequences of illicit sex, the unavoidable impact to the soul, particularly you know, in metaphorical terms it's spoken of in verses 27 and 28, and then you see it directly in verse 32. So is that a, is that, that's, is that a physical consequence? No, that's, that's a spiritual consequence. That's the consequence that the world doesn't have any knowledge of or suppresses any knowledge of. Turn back now to Proverbs chapter 2. And I want to read a significant part of the context to present a similar negative from chapter 6 in contrast with the a broader positive uh, side of the coin here. Chapter 2, starting in verse 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, or gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you, understanding will keep you. Positive side of the equation here. Jump down now to verse 16. The results. To deliver you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house leads down to death and her paths to the dead. None who go to her return, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you may walk in the ways of goodness and keep to the paths of righteousness. Now, is this a physical situation or a spiritual situation that Solomon is speaking of? Well, I think specifically, uh, well, there are physical manifestations perhaps, but when he's speaking of those who go <clears throat> to her house, uh, um, do not regain the paths of life, <clears throat> her house leads down to death, her paths, the, the path, her and her paths to the dead, that's a spiritual state, a spiritual uh, outcome. So do you see that there is a dimension of spiritual or soulish destruction that absolutely accompanies sexual immorality, promiscuity? That's the key. There's a, that's the absolute. We can avoid, the physical consequences may be avoided, but the absolute consequences cannot be avoided. The one who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Absolutely. Now the world says there are only physical positives and negatives and has devoted itself to eliminating any of the physical negatives in any area really of life. But even the physical positives of this aren't positive if pursued outside God's divine institution boundaries. And that's only at the universal level for mankind, which doesn't include the ways in which the, a believer or believers may experience positives of sex and marriage in context of two partners walking in the Spirit. But let's go back to the negative. The world calls out, indulge yourself in the physical pleasure of sex. 
There are no consequences for pursuing such pleasure outside the boundaries established by God in Scripture. And the world knows these boundaries, do they not? They're part of what's suppressed in Romans 1. And does this paraphrase of something sound familiar, this counsel of the world? Without turning there, let me quote something that will ring a bell. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Is God withholding something good from you? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, which was an addition there, as you know, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Oh, come on. Look at what is there to gain by eating that fruit that God is withholding. He's withholding something good from you. And after all, you're not going to die. For God knows, as he goes on, that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's his side of arguing for the positive benefits of of why you should eat. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And we all personally know all too well the results of that decision. So, does that, is, has things changed? I mean, is the world operating under new persuasions? <laughs> no, it's the same arguments. And this is a model of the dynamics of deception. Okay, now, turning for one last direct reference, we got one from the New Testament here regarding sexual immorality. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Okay, I'm breaking in. This is Paul speaking here of where the Corinthians had come from as unbelievers. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now he's drawing, he's drawing from the example of sexual immorality a broader point of fidelity to the Lord in all things. But in the context, he's, he's drawing on some spiritual aspects of the negatives of sexual immorality. And perhaps more clearly than we've seen in Proverbs, we detect a fundamental spiritual dimension in sexual activity. It is in this spiritual dimension that man will unavoidably reap according to what he sows, whether this activity is in the flesh or in the spirit. As to the negative spiritual consequences of illicit sex, there are perhaps a number of manifestations that are even tangible, but those that are not seen would include Um, scar tissue on the soul resulting in emotional hang-ups 
bitterness, anger, and many things that are prompted by damage to the soul. Now, I don't know everything about this, uh, but nevertheless, we do know that something negative will absolutely be reaped spiritually to the degree illicit sex has been engaged in. And Scripture is clear on this. Of course, we don't want to forget that there's a positive side. There will be special blessings upon those who heed the warnings and counsel and respect and honor both the biblical boundaries and interpersonal considerations of sex. God has designed it this way. These aren't things that we stand up and give pop-up testimonies over. Uh, but couples know and share this with each other according to their own experience. Okay, let's turn back to Galatians chapter 6. And we're going to reread verses 7 and 8. in wrapping up the point about the absolute present spiritual consequences of reaping or sowing to the flesh. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. We have seen how this is true just by briefly looking at what Scripture has to say about the realm of sexual activity, but it applies to all areas of life. In 1 John 2, 15 through 17, a familiar passage to us, we read, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Uh, verse 16, speaking of the different categories of lusts, might as well be, it could be considered a paraphrase of what we saw back in Genesis 3 what, that, that happened in the way that Eve was drawn away. The various categories of those things that captivated her. And that's a and it has become a controlling principle now in the world system. Now, if we sow to the various areas of lust that are of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, we will reap corruption accordingly in our souls. But if we sow to the Spirit, we do the will of God, we reap that which abides forever. And that has implications with respect to experiencing everlasting life now, but also with respect to future judgment and reward. And so the second part of the absolute of reaping what you've sown is applied in the eternal realm or the future judgment realm <clears throat> and reward. Now, this is rather straightforward. Man will not escape reaping in ultimate judgment exactly as he is sown in life. As much as the absolute spiritual principle of reaping spiritually in time according to what one reaps escapes us, perhaps, the reality in our thinking of final judgment might even be more remote. <laughs> uh, this is certainly true of the unbeliever, but it's largely true of us as believers. In general terms, regarding the certainty of judgment, Hebrews 9.27 states, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And we find a familiar citation in Philippians 2.9-11. through 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the, under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that these are broader statements of what is ahead. Scripture is more definitive about this. Back in Matthew again, Matthew 12. starting in verse 32. 
breaking in. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Every word we brought into judgment. In referring to man being held accountable for every word, Christ uses a figure of speech. I can't even pronounce what the figure of speech is. I looked it up, but the the, the idea is it taking from a an example of a category and applying it to a broader category. And what that means here is he's using man's words that he's going to be judged for to express man's full accountability to God for everything. So he, man's just not going to be judged for his words. He'll be judged for every aspect of his life. If accountability is true for, of every word, it is true of every thought and every action, etc. So this is a, a statement of absolute accountability inescapable, absolute accountability for reaping what you have sown in life. Turn to Revelations chapter 20. Verse 11. We'll read just a couple verses here. Twenty verse 11 and 12. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, uh, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Here we find a reference to the judgment of every unbeliever with emphasis on the reaping of the second death, on the basis of sowing human good works in lieu of accepting God's provision for Christ of Christ in salvation. There will be no escaping this. In a sense, this is consistent with reaping corruption for sowing to the flesh. There's, it's an absolute result. Um, and it speaks of both a broad result but also the specifics. Every aspect of the life will be brought to light. And this is part of the final resolution of the problem of evil. As Charlie Clough describes this resolution as a future event. This is a slide from Charlie's Framework series. And you see the two different models. The pagan view of, of life and existence, I should say, because you know they don't necessarily separate forever in a distinct way from present. Their model is that good and evil will coexist in some form forever and ever and ever. There will be no resolution, as it were. The Christian view looks at good and evil, the mix at this time, as abnormal. That is not the, the gonna, is not normal in God's created intent, creative intent, nor in His ultimate intent. And so that separation of good and evil will ha happen, as you see at the end of that middle line there, at some point in the future. Right now, good and evil are commingled in our existence, both even in our own present constitution as sinners. But God will separate good from evil, and in some way God will bring to closure all things that relate to to permanently separating evil from good. This includes resolution of all cases of deferred judgment or justice. Justice in particular circumstances which had not been meted out in time according to righteousness. We lament those cases constantly. Justice is not met out according to what we would recognize as righteous standards. In some way, God is going to resolve all of this in his separation of good and evil. God will settle all matters in going from time to eternity in a way that perfectly and completely satisfies justice. 
not only as pertains to himself, but also as relates to our yearning for such justice in life circumstances. And while we're here, and let's look in Revelation 21 for kind of a positive summary of where this where, where we are headed, starting in verse 1. I'll skip around a little bit, but... Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Down to verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And finally, verse 27. But there shall by no means enter into anything, enter it, this is into the New Jerusalem, speaking here, that comes down now out of heaven, anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So there is a separation, a complete, absolute separation in going into the future and in getting from where we're at to that point there will be an absolute perfect rendering of justice in that separation process. Now, with respect to the believer, now that's kind of general, that, that's speaking uh, primarily of the unbeliever's judgment with a little bit there at the end of final resolution of all things. But there is a different administration of judgment with the believer. Even in the Old Testament, this is alluded to. Turn to Job chapter 19. 19, verse 25. We'll read down through verse 29. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and He shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. If you should say, how shall we persecute him, since the root of the matter is found in me, be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. Now we're very familiar with the first verse there. I know that my Redeemer lives and He shall stand at last and I will see Him with my own eyes. But I read down to the end of the chapter because there's a context here of, e of eternal final judgment that, is, that um, Job mentions. Job looked ahead to the point of standing before his Redeemer that everything would be completely settled in justice on his account. So he even looked ahead to that. Turn to Proverbs chapter 23. Verse 17 and 8, verses 17 and 18. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. For surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. Now, why would Solomon speak this way if he didn't anticipate giving an account? Uh, with judicial satisfaction being met. He is counseling to tend to your life. You know, tend to it. Uh, be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. There are consequences. There is a hereafter. <laughs> we are going to give an account. All right, now that, you know, there was a lot less per known about God's plan in this than we have, which we will be looking at. But I think it speaks to the fact that they knew quite a bit. 
exactly what all those things were, we might not be able to uh, nail down completely. But for our perspective, it's instructed by explicit New Testament text. And there are several very familiar passages with respect to this on the believer's judgment. Turn first to Romans chapter 14. Romans 14, we'll start in verse 7. Okay. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Okay, we'll stop there. Paul specifically cites here an Old Testament passage that he had paraphrased, as we read earlier, in Philippians 2, 10 through 11. That, that passage is Isaiah 45, 23. So I didn't go to that passage when we were looking at Old Testament ones because I knew we would be here uh, in this passage. So there's another Old Testament reference to uh, absolute justice and judgment. But in doing that here, Paul validates as a universal principle of accountability of all ages and specifically here as pertains to the believer. There's an accountability of all people in all ages. But here he takes it and narrowly applies it to the judgment seat of Christ for the believer. But we see here a different venue, therefore, in judgment. It's the judgment seat of Christ. You may be familiar with this as Bema, the Bema seat. Though Bema is not the word for judgment. So don't mistake Bema as when we say the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. Bema is not judgment. And it might be confusing there. Bema is the complete, is the word that um, is translated by the phrase judgment seat. Bema is judgment seat. So it's really the Bema of Christ, not the Bema seat of Christ. You get that? I don't know if I got that clear. But the Bema, it's judgment seat. Um, it refers, in essence, to the divine tribunal before which all believers individually will stand in judgment. And you can see in the translation or in the meaning given by, at BibleStudyTools.com, it's used in other passages in some in a physical sense, like a raised place mounted by steps. There are a number of uses of this judgment seat, the bema, in Christ's being brought before officials at the end, you know, before the Roman officials. A platform, a tri tribune, and more generally, the official seat of a judge. So that's the way we would look at it as believers, the bema of Christ. Now, picture that for a moment. Try to picture yourself there. You're going to be there individually. We're going to each be there individually. Does it startle you? Does it frighten you? Does it move you at all? <laughs> we... <laughs> right. Well, we're not giving account for that. We can be thankful of that. But we do have some things to answer for. And we, to a person, we do not take this as seriously as we ought to. To a person, we do not. It is a remote concept. We have a very difficult time connecting our present lives with a future accounting for the way we live them. Just imagine, just take a day in your life and see, you know, how what you got caught up in and how much you uh, connected what you're getting caught up into what you're going to be answering for. Really, obviously, we can get a little bit too worked up about this if we, if you. You know, and then it just is an unproductive exercise. But 
The prospect of the judgment seat of Christ is not typically prominent among those factors that instruct our decision making. But it can and should be, and not primarily in a negative sense. There are positive, very positive elements to this. Turn now to 2 Corinthians 5, 6. 5, 6. We'll read down through verse 11. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Beyond a, another clear reference to the judgment seat of Christ in this passage that lies ahead for each believer, we find that it was something that kindled the fear of the Lord in Paul's heart. Now, the King James and the New King James use terror of the Lord, but that evokes the wrong sense of the word. That evokes just a, a very negative sense of what fear is. The idea here is a reverential awe of God, as we've seen in many other places. The fear, if you look at the New American Standard, it's translated fear of the Lord, and that's more appropriately what it should be taken as. The fear of the Lord is thus a strong underlying factor toward taking our future judgment seriously and then thus practically sowing to the Spirit. Finally, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. 18. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward." If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise." I read a bit further than I needed to by way of direct reference, but I wanted to show that the immediate context includes a strong exhortation to spirituality, coupled with a stern warning against self-deception of the flesh, which is parallel to what we're seeing in Galatians. So it, it, the two, they go together. I mean, it's these, practically speaking, this goes together. This passage contributes to a more specific understanding of what the believer's judgment will involve. Though there is not an explicit reference to the Bema here, it seems clear that in using the day, when Paul speaks of the day in verse 13, he is referring to this event. As believers, we build on the foundation of our secure found, uh, salvation in Christ by the choices we make in the Christian life. Note that sin, again, is not the issue, but works. We're going to be judged according, uh, according to our works as believers. In sowing to the Spirit, we figuratively build on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones. The good works we produce through sowing to the flesh, the good works, I should say, we produce through sowing to the flesh amount, on the other hand, to wood, hay, and straw. Christ's evaluation of us 
at this moment will strip away any and all parts of what we've built that aren't rooted in God's provision through the Spirit. It will be a thorough process. It will be an intense process. And what remains will be only that which honors and glorifies the Lord. And we will reap reward accordingly. And our rewards are spoken of in other places, different crowns and things, but I'm not going to develop that. Now, just some brief application in closing. We make choices every day. These choices frequently involve how we manage and dispense our resources. And I'm talking primarily here about how we spend our time. If we are not involved in outright sin, we often think we're faring well. As long as I'm not sinning, whatever I'm doing is great, fine, no problem. But in that mindset, we will forego the kind of choices God would have us make in keeping with maximizing our usefulness toward His purposes and glory, resulting also in greater reward toward attaining what we would all like to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. There are typically gaps in our devotion according to the choices we settle for or even indulge ourselves in that aren't sin, they're not sin, but are they wood, hay, and stubble nonetheless? Because the matter is not sin, don't forget. At the judgment seat, it works. There are always choices. In everything we do, there are always choices. I'm I'm like everyone else. You you just feel like I deserve a break. You know, I'm tired, I just want to go veg. Sit down and watch something. And I'm not saying that that's never a good thing to do, but I'm just saying we just tend to just, you know, we don't look at things with this in mind and say, by God's grace, what more can be done? You know, God's grace is sufficient for moving through tough times, lack of energy many times, all kinds of things. Fruitfulness is not equivalent simply to sin avoidance. Fruitfulness is not equivalent to sin avoidance. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. We have an opportunity by way of positive choices to reap bountifully. But we have to make positive choices towards those things. Not just simply avoiding sin, which of course would be prominent in our thinking, but in devoting ourselves to God's business in various ways. Okay, that wraps up a further development of the absolute aspects of reaping as related to the spiritual realm in the present time and in the future. Next time in verse 9, we'll start, we'll go there and we'll see another important aspect of sowing and reaping, or at least the dynamics of sowing and reaping. Okay, closing prayer. Father, we thank you for your provision for us. And we know that you're a gentleman. Uh, Though you have laid it all out and you are jealous toward our taking advantage, as it were, of what you have provided, you will not coerce us into making the choices that, that we are accountable before you to make according to what you have exhorted us to do in Scripture, in your Word. We just pray that as we... And devote ourselves, as we read in the early part of Proverbs 2, devote ourselves to taking in the word that we're diligent, that we will find that deliverance of the soul that comes by receiving the word implanted. And therefore, our hearts will be thus motivated to make the right choices more consistently because our perspective will be more and more your perspective. And then that's the end to which we are spending this time together. Uh, that we might live lives that are honoring and glorifying to you and we might, in the end, be able to stand before you and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And we just thank you again for our time today. In Jesus' name, amen.